we welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining our program today. We're going to go ahead and get started, but I'm, we're going to have some more people come in throughout the program. Uh, but for those who are there with us now, welcome. My name is Chloe Green. I am the Public Programs and Outreach Manager here at MCHC. And I really appreciate everybody who has registered and joined our program. And I'm very excited to introduce our panelists for today. I'm going to start with our moderator. So who is our wonderful Martin Mercado, who was recently promoted to Vice President of Research and Grants Merrick Director of the H. Furlong Baldwin Library. So Martina will be joining our fellow today for discussion and questions at the end of his presentation. But for now, I'm going to pass it to Martina. Thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, welcome everyone and, and welcome Dominique. Hi, thank you for joining us. Um, as we get started, I wanted to give a brief introduction of our speaker today uh, that we're very excited about. So Dominique Flowers uh, is our current Lord Baltimore Research Fellow at our library. He works as an attorney. He has practiced law for over 13 years, including bankruptcy and civil litigation cases at a law firm in Prince George's County. He currently works as an attorney advisor at the Social Security Administration and as a staff attorney at the Pro Bono Resource Center from, of Maryland. He has uh, taught college level classes for six years and was recently hired by uh, the University of Baltimore School of Law as an adjunct law professor and he teaches legal writing. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in 2021, he obtained his master's degree in historical studies at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And his thesis was entitled The Reckoning of Republican Allies the collaborative political efforts between Black and white Republican leaders in post-Reconstruction Baltimore. So we're super excited to have Dominique um, here with us. He has been researching uh, at our library uh, since June 2022, um, and spring is usually the season when we get to showcase our fellows' work. So uh, this is one of those occasions, and I'm so glad that everybody could join us today. Um, Dominique is working on a book project, a biography of Harry Syed Cummings, uh, which he will be telling us about in a minute, um, and his contributions to the political and legal advancements of African Americans in Baltimore City history as the first Black council member of Baltimore City. So the papers of Harry Cummings and the related um, collection of photographs are among the most popular collections in a library. They get requested quite often. And uh, one of the most prominent and, and favorite aspects of our work is uh, helping researchers like Dominique uh, on work on their projects. For those among the audience who might be interested in our research fellowships, our calls for applications usually open in the fall. So I invite everyone to uh, visit our website around that time to see uh, you know, what, what we have cooking and what you can apply for. With that short introduction, I think it's time to hand it over to Dominique. Are you ready? Thank you, Martina. Yes, I'm ready. And um, welcome to everyone who's decided to log on. I'm really excited that you're here. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and get started. Um, so I hope everyone can see my screen. I'm going to talk about the legacy of Harry Cummings. I'm very excited to speak on him. I've been doing research on him for a number of years. Um, and then I also want to ind indicate his impact um, in Baltimore City. I say post-reconstruction in my title, but it also um, involves um, before the Civil War era. So my presentation goes today, you know, introduce Harry Cummings and his life. Um, as Martina mentioned, he was the first uh, black city councilman in Baltimore City. Um, talk about some of his, um, his impact in terms of the early uh, trailblazing lawyers in Maryland, um, discuss his political achievements um, during his time in Baltimore City, and also with other legislation that he um, worked on um, to fight anti-suffrage laws. Um, also discuss his time off the council. There were several periods where he was up, where he served off the council as a community leader and um, was really integral, uh, integral in the um, anti-suffrage legislation fight of the early 1900s, which I'll introduce. Um, and lastly, talk about some of his remaining years in, um, on the council and in, in his life, where he uh, his main um, fight was against the Baltimore was against Baltimore's residential segregation ordinance. It was the first city in the country to have it. Um, so I'll go more into that later. 
Um, but let's look a little into his life. So he was born in 1866 in Baltimore City. Um, I have a picture of his mother and his father. His father served as a chef. Um, and his mother was in domestic services, although she did have a, a, a career um, raising support for um, Morgan State College at the time. It was called the Sentinel Bible Institute. Um, so he uh, grew up in Baltimore, Harry Cummings, um, until 1881 when he went to Lincoln University in Oxford, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, it, was a, it was a preparatory school because at the time, high schools were closed off to black students. Um, Harry Cummings also had a number of siblings. One of them is Ida Cummings. She would go on to become one of the first black um, educators in Baltimore City. Um, and then uh, shortly after completing Lincoln, he applied to the University of Maryland Law School. And he also read for one year in the office of a black lawyer named uh, Joseph Davis. Um, I want to pause here for a minute because I want to kind of give an idea of what the um, what the time period was like for, the, for black lawyers or, or black um, Americans who wanted to become lawyers in Maryland. Um, so I'm going to start with Edward Garrison Draper, but let's let's backtrack for a minute. During the 1800s, um, every up until 1832, every court in Maryland pretty much had its own um, set of guidelines on who they decided to admit um, into practice as, as lawyers. Um, obviously, none of them let black uh, black citizens in um, or black people who they weren't citizens at the time. They didn't let black people um, participate as lawyers. Um, in 1832, Maryland was one of the only states to actually pass a law that specified that only white males who were um, white males could practice law. This was 1832. This was, um, some historians think this was in, um, this is because of the Nat Turner re uh, revolution in 1831 in Virginia, and there was kind of a reaction to that. Um, so 1832, only white males could practice. Edward Draper, who I have on the screen, he was one of the first black graduates of Dartmouth. Um, he uh, was was found qualified to, to um, practice law. You know, he was, um, he, uh, he went in front of a judge, Judge Lee, who certified him as capable mentally to practice law if he were white. So his color kept him from um, practicing law, um, unfortunately. I'm going to go through these real quickly because I just want to kind of really run through some of the early um, um, pioneers who really fought to um, become black lawyers. James Wolfe, he was actually a Harvard graduate. Um, or at least he attended Harvard, and he um, came to Maryland in 1875, and he was one of the first black lawyers to practice at the federal court system in Maryland. So not the state courts, but the federal court. Unfortunately, he was denied admission um, to uh, practice in front of the state courts of Maryland. And this is just a little timeline that I wanted to kind of give you so you can have an idea of what, what we're talking about. Again, I have the statute here, Edward Draper, James Wolfe. In 1877, a black lawyer from Massachusetts who was already licensed in Massachusetts named Charles Taylor, he came to Maryland and he was um, allowed to practice in front of the federal courts of Maryland. However, um, he was denied admission to the Maryland bar. He petitioned the Court of Appeals um, in the case of Henry Taylor, and his petition was denied saying that the 14th Amendment, which is which was the um, amendment that he used to say that this was unconstitutional, did not apply to um, bar admission. Uh, fast forward to 1885, Charles Wilson, another Massachusetts lawyer, black lawyer, um, came to uh, Maryland and he was um, assisted by an organization called the Brotherhood of Liberty. They were one of the first um, civil rights organizations um, in the country, really. And they were founded in 1885 and they spearheaded a campaign to um, get rid of the statute and to make sure it was found unconstitutional. And so uh, Charles Wilson, he challenged the statute and lo and behold, the court, the Supreme Bench of Maryland found that um, it was unconstitutional for this law to prevent uh, lawyers, black lawyers from um, practicing law. Um, unfortunately, Charles Wilson, although he won his court case, he was still denied um, the ability to practice in front of uh, the Maryland State Bar for other reasons. Um, Everett Waring has the distinction of being the first black lawyer to um, practice at the state bar in Maryland. Um, he was also one of the first black lawyers to um, argue cases in front of the Supreme Court. So this kind of sets up the tone for Harry Cummings to come in. Um, as you see, one of uh, Everett Waring's colleagues, Joseph Davis, um, who was also a lawyer who um, was licensed in 1886, um, Harry Cummings came under his tutelage and uh, studied um, under him for a year um, before going to University of Maryland Law School. So this is a picture of University of Maryland Law School in 1889. Um, and just to kind of give you some context on why this is so important. Um, so we've got the 1885 Henry Wilson case that found the statute of the constitutional and allow um, black men to practice law. So, you know, now black men had a chance, a reason to want to practice law. There are really only two ways they could practice at the time. Um, one, they could read the law in a lawyer's office and be found qualified. Unfortunately, a lot of um, white lawyers didn't want black lawyers to practice, and so they didn't allow them to come into their 
uh, law office, and there weren't enough black lawyers at the time to accept black app, new black applicants. So the only other way that black um, men could become lawyers is to attend law school. Um, up until 1885, the University of Maryland Law School did not allow black applicants to come in. Um, and then with the court case, um, certain faculty members um, invited certain applicants to come in. So Harry Cummings was one of the first black applicants, along with his colleague Charles Johnson, to be admitted to the University of Maryland Law School in 1887. I mean, this was groundbreaking because really one of the only other law schools that blacks were able to attend was Howard Law School, um, which was still, which was, um, which had uh, been founded recently in the 1860s. Um, so to attend the University of Maryland Law School, I mean, this is the first time they actually allowed um, blacks to um, come in. Um, and Harry Cummings and Charles Johnson did really well. Um, the law program was three years. They finished it in two years. Um, they graduated in 1889 and were later admitted to practice law. Um, during law school, they both did very well. Um, they graduated in a class of 33. Uh, Cummings finished in 10th in, uh, among 33, and Johnson finished third. So that, that's pretty well. Um, I don't know if I finished uh, that high up in my law school class, but um, they did very well. They were, well, they were received by their colleagues. Um, and they were going to have a successful law practice until Mr. Johnson's death in 1869. Unfortunately, um, some of the other black lawyers who were admitted the same year they graduated wouldn't have the, the same um, level of success. So um, I have here Ashby Hawkins. Um, he was one of the early, an, an early black lawyer. He entered University of Maryland Law School in 1889, the same year that Cummings graduated. Um, him and another gentleman named James Doiser. Um, unfortunately, both of them were dismissed in 1890. There was a growing discontent among the students and staff at the law school saying, hey, we don't really want um, black um, students coming in, um, the students signed a petition, and the law school administration kind of caved into the students' demand. And in 1890, um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Um, Hawkins and Dozer were dismissed from law school. Now, um, Hawkins would later on go to graduate Howard Law in 1892, and him and Cummings would, uh, go to, would later work on um, other initiatives together. And we'll come back to Mr. C uh, Mr. Hawkins in a minute, so make sure you remember his name. Okay, so I, I just kind of, I wanted to give you an idea of some of the early achievements of Harry Cummings in terms of him being one of the trailblazing lawyers at the time. Now I want to kind of segue into his, some, some of his political achievements, um, particularly with him, um, his achievements on the Baltimore City Council and at the national level. So this is a picture of Harry Cummings. Um, I, don't, I don't know why I'm just now showing you a picture of him. Um, there was a picture at the beginning of the slide, but now here's a picture of him. Um, so he, his distinction is he was one of, he was the first African-American male um, who was elected to the uh, Baltimore City Council in 1890. And, and, and just really remember that um, this was a big deal because at the time there really weren't a lot of black um, elected officials. Um, there were some in the South. Um, because the southern states were protected by the Reconstruction uh, laws that went into place to allow greater political participation. Unfortunately, uh, Maryland was well, not unfortunately, but Maryland was not um, a southern state um, in a sense. Um, so it didn't come under the protections of Reconstruction law. And, and in other words, the Democrats actually controlled uh, the state politics in Maryland and made uh, things really difficult for blacks. Um, so between 1873 and 1890, the only black politicians were in Cambridge and in Annapolis. So Harry Cummings is one of the first um, black elected officials at this time. So it's a really big achievement. Um, and so he was a representative on the Baltimore City Council, um, the 11th Ward. And at the time, the Baltimore City Council was divided up into fir the first branch and the second branch. I won't go into those distinctions, but it was a bicameral um, legislator. So it had two kind of houses, if you will. Um, he was elected in part because uh, his district was uh, mainly comprised of black citizens um, in the 11th Ward. So let's talk about some of his, his achievements. So um, if you look on here, most of uh, Mr. Cummings' achievements um, during the city council were tied into education. And you're probably wondering why. So at the time, Baltimore City Council um, had uh, legislative authority over public schools. Um, and Baltimore City was really behind the times in terms of educating blacks. I mean, to give you a real quick history, uh, the history of Baltimore City public schools goes back to 1829 when the first public schools were opened. Um, of course, they don't know blacks. Um, black children had to be taught under uh, religious institutions or private institutions. Um, it really wasn't until 1865 that the city council even considered a measure to um, create a grammar school for black students. And even by then, there wasn't really a high school um, for black students to attend. Um, and really, the first black teacher in Baltimore City um, wasn't selected until 1889, shortly before uh, Mr. Cummings came on board to the council. Um, 
So let's look at some of his achievements on um, as a member of the Baltimore City Council. So he recommended the appointment of a young African American named Harry T. Pratt to the um, Maryland Institute of Art and Design. So at the time, city councilmen could make recommendations on selected students to attend the prestigious Maryland Institute of Art and Design. So this was the first time a black student had been selected to 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 um, be enrolled in that institution. Um, he also voted on different ordinances for the uh, purchase of different um, lots for the creation of colored schools. Um, perhaps his most crowning achievement during his first um, term on, in office is the creation of a manual training school for the colored youth of Baltimore City. Really at the time, um, in, 18, in the 1870s, there was a big push to um, bring in more black uh, men into the trades office. And there was actually a union in, in place um, up until 1870. In 1870, there was a dearth of black participation in scale labor. And there really wasn't, there weren't any schools around to teach black youths to caulk or to participate in some of the trades. Um, so with the establishment of a manual training school in 1892, um, this was a way to incorporate some of these skills and to really advance the um, the proliferation of black skilled workers to go into the job force. So it was, it was really a big deal. Um, and it was passed in 1892, was signed by Mayor Latrobe. Um, and um, Mr. Cummings was on the education committee, which is which helped spearhead this legislation. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, he wouldn't really be around long enough in, ter in terms of the city council to um, reap the benefits of this. Um, he was defeated in the fall of 1892. Um, some historians believe that um, he really um, upset a lot of people by um, trying to get Pratt um, um, admitted to the Maryland Institute, and that was the reason behind his defeat. Um, but um, after his defeat in 1892, his spot was filled in um, by a Republican, a white Republican um, named James Doyle, um, who, who um, who fulfilled that seat or who sat in that seat in 1893 and 1894. And by and large, you know, he still pursued educational um, rights for black citizens, although not to the same extent um, as, um, of course, um, Harry Cummings. However, he did um, recommend um, another black uh, student to the um, Maryland Institute of Art and Design. So he kind of followed that kind of course of action. Um, now, Dr. Cargo, John Marcus Cargo, was a, was a prominent physician, and he was elected um, to the Baltimore City Council in 1895. I won't talk about him too much since this is about Harry Cummings, but I do want to bring him in mind, um, particularly because he continued the work of Harry Cummings. Um, he served on the council in the same ward as Harry Cummings from 1895 until 1897, and he also um, strives to really increase the educational um, outlook and expansion for Black teachers and for Black students as well. Um, he had a much more difficult time than Cummings, um, and uh, I know uh, he was actually unsuccessful in um, nominating a student to the Maryland Institute of College, and, you know, he didn't let that slide. He actually petitioned um, the school to indicate why they wouldn't allow the black student to attend. Um, he actually reached out to Cummings, um, who um, wrote a, a letter with him to the mayor, um, kind of protesting why the black student wasn't allowed to attend. And it was actually a court case that went up into the, it was a petition filed to fight this. And lo and behold, Ashby Hawkins, I told you we'd come run into him. He was one of the lawyers who um, represented um, this young man that um, Mr. Cargill tried to appoint to the Maryland Institute of College and Art. Um, unfortunately, um, they were defeated. But I just wanted to kind of highlight um, Dr. Cargill's relevance in the kind of series of black politicians um, on the Baltimore City Council. Um, so, uh, both, uh, Harry Cummings was reelected in 1897. So, um, again, this is the 11th ward um, after Dr. Cargo. I'm, I'm not sure if Dr. Cargo ran again. I think, um, based on some of the defeats and the issues that he had with getting some of his measures passed, he decided not even to run again. Um, so, in 1897, council members were elected um, up until 1899. And if you look at this picture, this is a, a picture of all the council members. And if you look way back in the right side, you can barely, if you, you know, don't blink, but you can barely make out Harry Cummings out there as the only black uh, uh, person on the council. Um, so he returned to the council in 1897, and he continued his push for educational expansion. Um, you know, he established one of the first citywide kindergarten programs. He hired a black uh, directoress uh, for sewing in black schools, and he also started a night school in the, uh, for, um, at the Color Polytech Institute. So he, and, and really, the reason this is important is because education obviously prov um, provides other opportunities. So the fact that we were educating more students meant that we, that black students and by extension, black teachers and black educators had greater autonomy, they had greater 
agency to make in, important decisions. And having a, a black person on the city council meant that citizens overall in the, in the in Baltimore City had great agency to demand change. And, and black, you know, he was certainly um, beholden to his constituents to make these changes. Um, so it gave not just him, but other black citizens in Baltimore great agency to effectuate change during his time on the council. Um, now, um, he had other political contributions. Um, he was selected by Mayor, Hay uh, Mayor Hayes to serve on the board of directors of the Colored House of Reformation and Instruction for Colored Youth. So this was an this was a panel um, that oversaw um, you know youth who needed further direction or who had been incarcerated. But I believe uh, Harry Cummings' his crowning achievement in the area of politics outside the council was when he was selected by Theodore Roosevelt to give the nomination. So if, I know the slides are a bit hard to make out, but on the left side um, is a portion of Harry Cummings' speech. You can see his signature. And on the right side is an invitation from Theodore Roosevelt, and I'll read it. It says, I thank you for your speech. I thought it excellent in every way. So, the, so um, Harry Cummings was able to give the speech um, at the vault at the Republican National Convention in Chicago in 1904. He was he was the first black person to be given this honor. And as you can see from the letter written by uh, President Roosevelt himself, um, he he appreciated it. So I thought that was a really big advancement in terms of black political participation. Um, now. Harry Cummings will return on the city council, um, but I want to kind of segue and, sh and shift gears a bit to some of his community involvement um, and his civil rights uh, legacy in terms of the anti-suffrage movement, which we'll get into in a couple of moments. So I, I, I may have mentioned them in passing in an earlier portion of the presentation, but the Brotherhood of Liberty um, bears um, some, some attention. Again, they were one of the first um, civil rights organizations in Baltimore City. They were started by Reverend Johnson of the Union Baptist Church, um, and, and they initiated a series of legal challenges um, to, I guess, break down the barriers of, of, of segregation and white supremacy. Um, Everett Waring, who I mentioned earlier, who was the first black lawyer in Maryland to be to practice in front of Mar in, in, in the Maryland bar, um, he was actually of counsel. So he was the counsel for the um, Brotherhood of Leadership. I mean, they kind of spearheaded his um, his um, attempts to, to become the first black lawyer. And so um, he. Uh, Everett Waring fought um, several cases on behalf of the Brotherhood of Liberty to kind of break down the barriers of, of white supremacy and um, racial discrimination. Now, it's unknown if Cummings ever joined um, with the Brotherhood of Liberty. He was certainly aware of their existence. I mean, he um, financially contributed to them, um, but he did directly benefit from them um, because of the work they did in fighting for the rights of African Americans to practice law. Again, as I mentioned earlier, Harry Cummings was one of the first black lawyers um, following Everett Waring. Um, his colleague as well. And he also studied, like I mentioned before, under the second black lawyer, um, Joseph Davis. Um, and he also worked with several of the former members of the Brotherhood of Liberty. Unfortunately, they were only around between 1885 to roughly 1890, 1891, um, around the same time he was elected. Um, but some of the um, pivotal figures of the Brotherhood of Liberty um, still continued to fight even after the dismantleship of the organization. The picture you have here on the left is uh, Reverend um, uh, Harvey Johnson. On the right are, are a number of individuals. Uh, Harry Cummings is the bottom, um, second from the left. Ashby Hawkins is in there, um, as well as other prominent black officials at the turn of the century who were former, former members of the Brotherhood um, and then also continued into another organization, which I'll get into in a few moments. Um, again, I want to kind of give you the backdrop of what's going on politically and in the context of, of, of the environment in Baltimore City. So up until 1895, the, the Democrats were in control um, and they, you know, they were um, led by a, a gentleman named Gorman, who was kind of like a Democratic mob boss. Um, he fixed elections at the local level to maintain control. Um, but due to a series of reforms and different challenges, the Republicans took over the state house of Maryland and also some of the um, seats in the legislature and at the city council level in 1895. And so they held on to 1895, uh, to the power of Maryland between 1895 and 1900. And during that period, you see a lot of achievements of black Mer uh, citizens. It wasn't perfect, obviously. I mean, we had Plessy after all in 1896. But during that short four or five year period, you do see some advancement in terms of black citizens 
um, who are able to get jobs. Education is, is, a, is a focus with the administration. And again, this is the period where Dr. Cargill, who I mentioned earlier, he was elected in 1895. And so the Republican victory kind of paved the way for local black politicians. Uh, Harry Cummings, who came back to the council, as I mentioned in 1897, um, to lead um, um, the 11th Ward. So all was, was going well until 1900. So the election of 1900 was um, pretty detrimental. Um, this is a slogan, a rallying cry from the Democratic Party um, who sought starting in 1899 to take back the state um, from the Democrats, I'm sorry, from the Republicans. And their message was, um, you know, we, we, they, their West message was one built on white supremacy. They, they focused on the Negro problem, um, saying that, you know, the blacks were were in charge and they were corrupting the city and we need to take the city back. And this agenda really permeated into the society. And really, if you do a lot of research in this area, the Republicans really weren't as organized as they could have um, because they lost control of the state. And as a result, um, the Democrats took control um, in the 1900 election. And as I'm sure you can imagine, they um, wasted no time and, and um, you know, setting back, setting back the advancement of African-American rights by decades. Um, some of their first challenges um, included um, curtailing the ability for of Black Americans to vote. So there were several laws that were kind of um, thrown around in, in the early 1900s. There was a, a, a law here to, to change the name, to change the requirement of reading. So um, I guess to target the uh, illiterate Black uh, voters. There was also a ballot box um, initiative that changed party symbols. So just initiatives to make it more difficult for Black citizens to vote. Um, many of these measures really weren't successful early on um, due to um, some of the early um, Republican challengers who kind of spearheaded efforts to kind of counteract these measures. Um, of course, um, early um, Black Americans and Cummings and some other Black leaders also fought these measures. So you really don't start a lot of, you don't see a lot of gain in terms of um, some of these measures until you get to about 1904. And then we come to the Paul Amendment. And I want to read um, what the Paul Amendment was. So the Paul Amendment was described as the first and most serious threat to the Negro suffrage Maryland, um, and a, which was a frank imitation of deep Southern restrictions. So why is it called the Paul Amendment? So the University of Maryland Dean John Prentice Poe, he's a, some type of distant relationship, a relative of Edgar Allan Poe. I think he's a second cousin twice removed or something. Um, he was, um, he, he fought, um, he was um, anti-suffrage. He, he fought against um, black rights in, in terms of getting admitted to Maryland, to University of Maryland. That's why Ashby Hawkins and Mr. Doiser were kicked out in 1890. And he actually um, got into league with um, Gorman, who was the political boss for Democrats at the time. And both of them crafted this law called the Paul Amendment, and it was named after him because he was the author. Um, so the Paul Amendment, and by, its, by its wording, it, it's, it had two provisions. So the first provision indicated that, um, you know, citizens whose grandfathers were eligible to vote as of January of 1869 could vote. Now, if you do your history in 1869, <laughs> Um, were Blacks given the right to vote? Well, um, a little thing called the 15th Amendment in 1870 didn't come around until then. So if you have a grandfather in 1869 and you were Black, you, obviously you were prevented from voting because the 13th Amendment hadn't been passed yet. So this was obviously um, a way of, of preventing pretty much all Black citizens from voting. There was a second provision of, as well saying that if you were prohibited under the grandfather clause to vote, um, this was called the qualifying clause, the reasonable explanation clause. It basically said as long as you could read a portion of the Maryland Constitution um, and, and provide a reasonable explanation, then you'd be allowed to vote. So even if you couldn't vote under the grandfather clause, as long as you can read a portion of the Maryland Constitution, um, and then, you know, this was based on a random voter regist uh, register officer, and he can explain that, then you would be allowed to vote. Now, I'll tell you this, I'm a lawyer now, and I really haven't taken a look at the Maryland Constitution. So you can imagine how many citizens, both black and white, um, were barred from the insidious wording of this particular amendment. So, uh, so let's talk about um, Cummings and his work with, this, with the Suffrage League of Maryland. So, um, the Paul Amendment, so just to give you some context, um, the Paul Amendment had, it was a, it was a, a constitutional change um, in Maryland. In other words, in order for it to go into effect, um, there had to be a referendum because it was a constitutional change. In order for the state constitution to be changed, the voters have to vote for it. So um, it wasn't on the books yet, 
but it had to it would have had to be voted on in the uh, November 1905 election for it to actually pass and to become a part of the um, of the of the law of the land. So as you can imagine, during the late 1904, 1904 early 1905 periods, there is a spirit, there was a, a concerted effort by black citizens and, and certain white citizens alike to defeat this measure and ensure that and prevent its passing. Um, Again, I had the same picture I presented earlier of Cummings and some early black leaders uh, who were already involved in other measures such as uh, racial restrictions in, in terms of separate car laws that were passed in the 1900s. And so many of these black leaders came together to form what's called the Suffrage League of Maryland. Um, and they were in league with another organization called the Baltimore Reform League. And they were started by white Republicans. So you had the white Republicans who were leading the Baltimore Reform League and mostly black Republicans and black leaders who were leading the League of Suffer the Suffrage League of Maryland. And they kind of put their differences aside um, to combat the mutual enemy of not only the Democratic Party, but this poll amendment. Um, so as you see, um, Ashby Hawkins, um, Reverend Bragg, who was a prominent um, leader in the Suffrage League, they all banded together to, to initiate efforts to defeat this and prevent it from passing. Now, what are some of the strategies they used? So the Suffrage League, I mean, they went all out. They held rallies. Um, they um, really raised donations. They taught illiterate Blacks on how to vote as, in addition to the rules and regulations. Um, they initiated a, a monumental um, voter registration drives to not only focus on those who were able to vote, but also Black citizens who, 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 aren't, who aren't registered yet, so they wouldn't decrease that. Um, and so they really enacted a lot of measures to ensure that this amendment would be defeated in the November 1905 election. Um, so, you know, that's all well and good. What did Cummings himself do? What, did, what was his individual impact on this movement? So Cummings was one of the was one of the uh, spearheading figures behind this. Um, in addition to being a part of one of the leaders of the Suffrage League of Maryland, he also um, held other rallies. Um, I, I put on here um, in September 1905. Um, he met at the Methodist Episcopal Church where he gave an address to the, to the congregation about the dangers of this amendment and what will happen if it's passed. Um, he also spoke at the, um, another church. So churches were used as a safe zone, as a venue for black citizens to kind of meet, discuss um, changes and to really um, voice their concerns. And so uh, a lot of church leaders came together, Reverend Bragg, who I mentioned earlier, um, to really spearhead this effort and convince their congregation to fight this. Um, another big achievement of Cummings is that he actually reached out to national prominent figures. Um, so this includes Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. E. Du Bois, who, of course, at the time were the, were the um, I guess, the, the most prominent national civil rights figures of their age. Um, so Washington, um, his methods were, were not as well received by some of the early black leaders in Baltimore because they were seen as too passive. Um, so he provided help and assistance uh, surreptitiously. He didn't want his name to be known. So he, um, he communicated with Cummings. So here, you know, here are some funds, but I don't want my name to be known. And so um, Cummings respected his wishes and didn't really announce his contributions. Um, he also worked with, uh, Cummings also worked with W.E.B. Du Bois in this fight, um, the Niagara Movement, um, had certain chapters in Baltimore City. Cummings and other members of the um, Suffrage League of Maryland uh, ran uh, local chapters. And as many of you know, the Niagara Movement was one of the forerunners to the NAACP. So you see here a mixture of local leaders, especially Cummings, working with national leaders on these measures. Um, and I want to kind of move on because I want to make sure I have enough time. Um, and then I also put on here that, um, you know, really a lot of the early black leaders in Baltimore really um, not kind of were attracted to W.E.B. Du Bois' spirit of, you know, fighting the powers. And, you know, they didn't really um, take into consideration w, uh, Booker T. Washington's approach, which, you know, of course, was the antithesis to the way W.E.B. Du Bois um, thought that we should fight racial discrimination. Um, so to jump forward into 1905, the poll amendment was defeated. Um, here are some statistics about, you know, what happened in terms of voter registration and turnout. Um, you know, 80% uh, of the black voters in Baltimore, and again, this was a statewide referendum, and you can see that 80% of black voters in Baltimore who were registered kind of came out to vote. So it was really a big deal. Um, it was reported by the newspapers that this measure was defeated, and on and, and this was due obviously to the impact of not only the suffrage league, but the integral leaders such as Cummings himself. Um, I also put on here there were other measures uh, put into place um, similar to the Poll Amendment, the Strauss Act, and the um, the Diggs Amendment, and these are just other um, cracks that the Democratic um, 
uh, party tried to take in order to, um, again, disenfranchise blacks from voting, and they were subsequently um, defeated as well. Now, we also see a return of uh, uh, Mr. Cummings to the Baltimore City Council. So between 1899, when he left the council up until 1907, his seat was filled by Hiram Wati. He was the third black councilman. So you've got Harry Cummings, Dr. Cargill, and Hiram Wati. Um, and so um, he led some of the same charges as both Dr. Cargill and Harry Cummings, and he was also a member of the uh, Suffrage League. But after he decided not to run in 1907, Harry Cummings was reelected to Baltimore City Council. Um, again, he focused more on bringing national attention to Baltimore City. Again, I put on here that he hosted the National Negro Business League to hold its convention. Um, he also invited Booker T. Washington um, to come. So he really reached out to some of these national organizations, these national figures to bring attention to what was going on in Baltimore. And keep in mind, you know, even though the Paul Amendment was defeated in 1905, we still had those earlier amendments that I mentioned. And th those are still fights that he had to take the, um, the he, he took on in addition to the other members of the Suffrage League. Um, it's important to realize though that um, when Harry Cummings came back to office um, in 18, um, in 18, I'm sorry, 1907, um, it was a different environment in Baltimore City Council. You didn't really see a lot of the same camaraderie that he had with his colleagues back in the late 1800s, or 1890s rather. Um, he really had to fight to get a lot of his measures across. Um, uh, these are some of the um, policies um, during his time in the council from 1907 forward. Again, um, you know, many of them were tailored toward education. Um, he introduced several bills to um, appropriate funds for um, expansion of, edu of color education. As you see on the right side, he was unsuccessful in some of these attempts, um, mainly because um, as many of the um, white leaders in the, in, in the city council um, weren't really as tuned in to black civil rights as the earlier white leaders um, in Baltimore City Council um, in the late 1890s. So this is a real struggle for him. He was he was successful on some fronts and other fronts he wasn't. Um, and I also have one here that he, um, you know, he participated in encouraging um, blacks to assimilate into the armed forces during World War One, which is um, which is started in, um, I believe, 1914, although America didn't enter into 1917. Um, now, one of his last big fights was the racial, Baltimore's racial segregation ordinance, and I'm going to um, fly through this real quickly. So this is an ordinance basically saying that blacks had to live on one side of the street, whites had to live on one, uh, the other side of the street. And it, and it really, um, it, it had the dubious distinction of being the first of every city in the country, first housing, residential housing segregation ordinance on the books. Um, and it was passed several times in 1910, 1911, 1913. Um, each time, um, Harry Cummings led a concerted effort to counteract it. Um, it was passed first in 1911 by both branches of the city council. Um, you know, Cummings would spend most of his remaining time on the council really combating this. Um, in the 1913 measure, he would join forces with Ashley Hawkins, who, by the way, was actually one of the petitioners involved in this ordinance. Um, I believe he was the plaintiff. Um, when this when this particular ordinance was taken to to um to the court, um, and so it was found unconstitutional by the Baltimore Supreme Bench several times, and I won't go into the the details of the amendment, but finally in 1970, 1917, it was defeated um, after a recent Supreme Court decision found that racial se re residential segregation laws were a violation of property rights, and so the Maryland court system said, okay, let's take a page from the Supreme Court book and apply it to this current case involving the fight against this ordinance. Uh, and that, that was due in no small part to uh, Cummings and his work with the NAACP, which was by this time established. Um, again, these were getting into the last, year of his, last years of his life, but during his 50th anniversary, or sorry, his birthday, um, he was given an award by the city council. Um, I, I believe it was um, a time, um, it, was, it was far removed, and I believe it was, it was about time that he was given the, the due that he was um, honored and, and deserved. Um, and sadly, in 1917, September 1917, he would pass away um, from a debilitating sickness. Um, you know, the city um, held a ceremony for him. Uh, flags were, right, were at half mass. Um, he left his wife, Miss Cummings, who he married in 1899. He also had two children who would um, survive him. Um, the Baltimore Sun did a brief editorial on his death, and they mentioned some of his achievements, but it's really the Afro-American newspaper, which was started in the 1890s, that really um, did a fantastic job that to showcase the legacy that he left in Baltimore City and his achievements, which which would, would have gone unknown had it not been for um, their um, concerted efforts to make it widely known what he did. So I leave you with this question as I am running um, shortly on time. So what was the legacy of Harry Cummings? What what do we take from this? 
And my question or my response to that is, you decide. <laughs> I mean, let's let's just go. Let's just give a, a, a recap of some some of his achievements. Um, he was one of the earliest African American lawyers in Maryland, one of only two who graduated from University of Maryland Law School, which closed its doors in 1990 up until 1936, when there was a court case, the Murray case, which when um, they were compelled to finally allow um, blacks to be admitted into law school. Um, he contributed and benefited from the United Brotherhood of Liberty, again, one of the earliest civil rights organizations in the entire country. It predated the Niagara Movement and the NAACP itself. He was the first African-American city councilman in Baltimore City, and his influence was, um, was, was phenomenal in passing education legislation, the likes of which had not been seen before. Again, a year before his, his election, the first African-American teacher in Baltimore City came on the scene. So you can tell how far behind Baltimore City was. Um, he also spoke at the presidential candidate uh, uh, nomination speech uh, for President Roosevelt, the first African-American to do that. Um, he led a vibrant campaign against the anti-suffrage legislation, um, and he um, rubbed shoulders and elbows with prominent figures such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Um, he was active in, in several functions in the Niagara Movement, which, again, is the forerunner of the NAACP. And finally, um, you know, his his last remaining years in the city council, he fought against and was successful against the first ever residential segregation statute of its kind in the entire country. Um, so that kind of concludes my presentation. These are some of the sources I used, um, by far not all of them. This is not a, um, a conclusive list or a comprehensive list, but these are some of the main sources I used in my research um, to really highlight and, um, this enormous and this, this phenomenal figure and to really focus on his achievements, not really just with Baltimore City, but in Maryland and for, for Black rights continuing on. Thank you so much, Dominique. You were right on time. I congratulate <laughs> you on condensing so much information in literally 45 minutes. So uh, I really appreciate that as, as moderator. Um, so insightful, um, so many questions and, and so many things to talk about. Um, so maybe we can, we can just jump into the Q&A. And this is also where I would like to invite the rest of our audience to uh, think of your questions for our speaker today. Uh, please um, enter them in the Q&A. You have a, there's a button on the bottom, bottom of your screen, so you can use that to place your questions and we can pull from there. Um, and maybe I can um, open it up with um, the question of how many black Republicans served on the city council during Cummings' time and afterward? So uh, thank you for that. So um, Cummings, him and Dr. Cargo and Harry and Wadi really paved the way um, for the inclusion of African American polit politicians. So between 1890 and to roughly 1931, we had a total of, of six black Republicans served. So following um, Cummings and his death, there were several prominent members um, of the Baltimore City Council who served. And around 1907, the terms kind of changed. So when Cummings was elected before that, it was two year terms. From 1907 up until the present day, there were four year terms. Thank you. And um, so you know, going back a little bit, um, also another question, did Cummings ever work with some of the earlier black lawyers that came before him? Yes, so uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. So again, going back to Everett Waring and Joseph Davis, they were the really the two uh, first lawyers in Maryland. Um, eight, uh, Everett Davis was um, nominated to practice law in 1895. Shortly following him was Joseph Davis. And actually they were really integral and in kind of um, counseling and coaxing um, Cummings during his time at law, at University of Maryland Law School. Again, Cummings read under Joseph Davis before going to University of Maryland Law School. And then when he graduated, there was kind of a ceremony thrown by the black community. Um, I believe Joseph Davis was there. Um, he put on the ceremony. Uh, uh, Everett, da uh, Everett Waring spoke at the ceremony. Both of them gave gifts to him, to Cummings and his colleague, Charles Johnson, in terms of you know, providing him with books and assistance. And I'm pretty sure, although I have no sources to prove this, I'm pretty sure they interacted at some, on some level involving the United Brotherhood of Liberty and some of their um, uh, court challenges in the um, 1880s and 1890s. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have um, a few questions that relate to, I guess, the University of Maryland. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to group them so that they make sense for you. Um, 
One of them is, uh, were you able to locate any primary sources regarding the student slash faculty petition and ultimate decision to prohibit black students at UMD Law School? Do we know if this documentation exists and where? So in terms of primary sources, no, there was an article that I read and I don't have it with me, but it was written by, um, I believe it was written by Professor Gibson, but basically um, it was written in 18, I'm sorry, 1985, which is the 100th year anniversary of the uh, Charles Wilson case, uh, Henry Wilson that uh, found the racial uh, restriction against black lawyers unconstitutional. And so it really goes into depth about the, I guess the, the process involved in admitting um, uh, uh, Cummings and Charles Johnson. So really 18, uh, University of Maryland uh, was started in 1823, I believe. The law school briefly shut down in 1833 and reopened in 1870. And at the time, there were really only, I believe, four teaching faculty and four non-teaching faculty. And so they had to decide whether or not to admit black, uh, black students. And there was, there was kind of a debate between them. Um, the article really covers that a lot. Um, um, and then so, the, you, you know, Cummings and Johnson were finally admitted with votes from certain um, figures. Um, I can't remember the figures offhand. Obviously, there were the detractors. One of them was the dean himself, Poe, who was really against um, admitting Black students, but he kind of just, you know, grumbled about it and accepted it. And based on the reading of the article, um, you know, Johnson and Cummings were treated fairly well um, in that regard. But I'm sure there are other sources that speak to that, but that's, that's the secondary source I found. Yeah, so that was another question, how they were treated when they were um, at the University of Maryland Law School. Um, would you like to add anything to that or? Sure, so I found a, a New York Times quote, and I, I'll have to read it. So based on that quote, but an observation. So, um, you know, a lot of this, many of my primary sources were newspaper articles, especially Baltimore Sun, but the New York, the New York Times, and you can tell, you know, attract the New York Times to a, 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 ceremony, a ceremony in Baltimore meant that it was really widespread. Um, and so they commented on how, you know, the students conducted themselves, quote, in good judgment and tact of the two colored ones who were graduating. There was a kind sentiment about them. So it doesn't appear at the time that the students um, were antagonistic toward Johnson and Cummings. It really only changed a year later in 1890 when the students really, and this was due to a series of political events with Gorman and the Democrats and certain measures that the sentiment toward admitting black students changed all, the, all of a sudden in 1890. And really 90% of the petitions, uh, the students petitioned saying, hey, look, if you don't start admitting students, we're leaving. I think at the time there was a new law school, Baltimore University Law School had just recently opened. And so there was an option. And so Poe and the other faculty were say, you know, we can't lose tuition. So we're going to, you know, kick Ashby Hawkins and Dozier out. And that decision remained up until 1836, uh, 1936 with the Murray case, which is really one of the first um, cases by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund um, in their pursuit to dismantle Brown v. Board. Um, so when did the University of Maryland open its doors to Black students again? Oh, no problem. So this was, eight, so um, <laughs> yeah. in the uh, mid 18, uh, and I keep saying 1800s, 1930s, um, right. Thurgood Marshall, um, first Black Supreme Court Justice, um, he was an early, he was a, a, a lawyer who worked with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to dismantle uh, Brown v. Board, which, which would come later, um, through a series of, of test cases. And so one of the first ones was Murray uh, v. Pearson, I believe. I could be, I know Murray is one of the um, the participants, but basically this was a gentleman who applied to the University of Maryland Law School and he was denied admittance um, based on the fact that, and then, you know, there was, it was under the separate but equal doctrine from Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, lo and behold, uh, Thurgood Marshall um, petitioned in, on his behalf and the courts forced the University of Maryland to open uh, um, their doors because there were no separate but equal um, schools in Maryland. The University of Maryland was the, one of the only law schools in Maryland at the time. And so the, the rationale was, well, you can say separate but equal, but there were no other facilities. So you had no choice but to open it up. Um, so th that was kind of when um, the floodgates opened in terms of allowing black students in and really advancing um, uh, black achievement in, in the uh, area of education. Thank you. Um, another question from our audience is, where did Cummings live? Does his house still stand? Yes, um, as it's interesting you said that. So his house, one of it, his, I, I don't know if it's his childhood home, but it's actually on Utah Street. Um, I remember a few years, and if you go down Utah Street, there's a, and you, there's no placard or anything, you would actually have to know this, but there is an abandoned house there. I think it's, there's, it's, it's boarded up, but it is the, one of the, I think 
I believe he lived there when he was married with his wife in the early 1890s. I'm not sure if it was his child at home, but it still stands. And I know there was some effort to maybe renovate it into a museum. I, I was actually interested in possibly, um, you know, helping that. Um, it fell forward, so now it's really just a dilapidated building, which is a shame because I believe um, it, it, it really needs some renovation to really highlight his achievements and, and, and designate it as a landmark. That's really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, maybe a final call for our audience members who want to place in, you know, one last question because we have a few more minutes left. Um, but maybe I'll start to wrap it up with um, a question of my own, which is um, maybe taking it back to why we choose the research topics that we do. Um, so clearly there is an attorney connection between you and Harry Cummings, um, and you've been working on this research for a number of years, you know, from your master's thesis to now you know, a research fellowship and potentially a book. Um, how would you say your understanding of Harry Cummings has evolved over time, the more you know about him? You know, what you were know, your initial suppositions starting, you know, to look into him, his life and work, and then where, where you are now in your research? Sure. No. So I initially got interested in Harry Cummings based on my own political aspirations in terms of outreach efforts I've um, in the, I've worked with with local organizations involved in local politics. And then um, and I, I, I'm looking at his name, um, a gentleman, a professor who wrote a history book on Baltimore City. I, I can't remember his name, but he's a Johns Hopkins professor. Um, but reading his book was my first introduction to Harry Cummings. Um, and, and so I wanted to write my thesis on him because I was impressed mainly by his, his standing as the first black um, council member. But also I was very surprised that no one had done this research before. I mean, it was really difficult. I mean, there were people had written um, pieces of Harry Cummings here and there in terms of the black Republicans or civil rights or, you know, he was involved in certain areas, but there was really nothing to tailor on him. And unfortunately, because of the nature of writing a thesis, I was unable to really um, center my focus on Harry Cummings involving my thesis. I had, you know, I wrote on black and white Republican leaders and, and Harry Cummings was involved in, in that aspect as the Republican leader. But I really wanted to focus more on Harry Cummings in terms of my re research. And the more I delved into some of the primary sources, the more I saw connections that he had with other um, uh, incidents in Baltimore, other, um, you know, um, uh, programs in Baltimore, you know, the anti-suffrage movement, the or, the first city residential ordinance, the achievements of other prominent Black figures. He was always involved. His name kept popping up here and there. So it was really impressive to find that. Um, and then I was, again, currently I do want to work on a book for him. Um, I'm even thinking about possibly a law review article or some publication that really highlights his achievements and, and makes them wide known. Because right now, I mean, when I mention his name, people confuse him with Elijah Cummings, um, mm -hmm. There's a building downtown across from, from the Baltimore City Council that's named after him. But really, there's nothing that really showcases what he really did. And I think that's a travesty. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm clicking through your presentation because we have a comment in the chat that uh, says Matthew Crenson of Hopkins University wrote the book. Matthew Baltimore, Crenson, which, that's it. Yes, which thank you, you did. very much. <laughs> Which you did quote in your in your main sources. So um, thank you to um, oh, it's Bradley Alston, of course. Of course, thank you for for helping us out with that. Yeah, um, I don't have any other questions from the audience. So um, I think I want to thank Dominique so much for um, taking the time to talk to us about this today. Um, I learned so much more than, you know, just from you as we work on your fellowship. Um, and um, Chloe, I'm going to beat you to it. I'm going to also invite our, <laughs> our audience to our next Lord Baltimore Fellow Public Talk, which will be in April. So um, you have two months to prepare for it, but it will be by um, our fellow Sophie Hess. And the title of her talk will be Making and Learning Environmental History in Maryland. Um, so a, a change of pace and a change of topic, but um, also great research. We've been working with Sophie since June last year, and um, we very much look forward to, to that one as well. Um, so thank you again, um, Dominique. Um, Chloe, would you like to take it away? Um, sure. And while we're going into our closing comments, I might just see another comment. Up, or another question pop up in the chat. So I don't know, Dominique, if you would want to take a minute to answer. I think it's um, from Paula, and she's actually asking, with current funding to rehabilitate housing in Baltimore, is it possible to bring the attention of Mayor Scott to see this as a possible rehab project? 
that's a very good question. There was an organization, um, it escapes, the name of the organization escapes me, but I know they really work with preserving historic landmarks in Baltimore City. And I don't believe the house is designated as a historic landmark. It could very well be. And of course, there's a lot of, there, there are nuances involved in making that designation. But I, I believe that's a great project to, to undertake. Um, I know there are a lot of hurdles in terms of, you know, first of all, designating it as a historical landmark um, under whatever um, function that is or whatever um, policy that is. And then the finding funds to rehabilitate the house. I mean, it's not a big house. It's a, it's a row house, basically. Um, I've, I've thrown around the organization I was talking about, whose name again escapes me. Um, someone might be able to reveal in the chat. Um, but I have thrown around the possibility of turning it into a museum for Harry Cummings, um, similar to, um, there's another museum dedicated to another African-American leader in Baltimore um, whose name escapes me. I apologize. I'm really sensitive to Harry Cummings, but it's not too far from there and um, kind of in the same vein. I believe it's on Utah Street as well. Um, but just kind of, you know, it, it would take a concerted effort of citizens to kind of figure out the steps that need to be taken to um, initiate that. But I would be on board um, in, in terms of, um, you know, really working with whoever wanted to take that uh, project on. Yes, the Baltimore City CHAP. Thank you very much. I appreciate um, you, Rob. Th that's the organization I was thinking about. I know I spoke with one of the reps a few years ago about that. So. Very nice. Well, thank you, Rob. Thank you, everybody, for your Q&A questions. And thank you, Dominique, for answering that last one. Sure. I just didn't want it to go unanswered. Um, I actually see one more. Yes. Thank you, Mary. Um, so we are coming up right to 1259. Um, Dominique, I have to say, I don't know the last time we had a panelist who finished with such perfect timing, <laughs> especially <laughs> on such a like, complex topic, so thank you. Uh, but thank you so much for your time and sharing your research. This was fantastic. Thank you, Martina, for being a wonderful moderator and for working with Dominique over his fellowship. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and joining us as everyone's filtering out. Um, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. As we said in the beginning, this program has been recorded, and it also says it in the chat, and it will be edited and shared out in the coming weeks. Um, so we will let you all know. We will also follow up this program with an email with resources that Dominique shared during his presentation today and some other information that we want to tack on because we're a history institution and we got lots to share. Um, but otherwise, we really hope to see you all at future events and truly are very grateful for your participation and tuning in today. And yes, we do like citations. <laughs> Thank you for those, Dominique. Uh, but I wanna wish everybody a great rest of your day, a great rest of your week. Um, have a, yeah, just everybody be good. <laughs> Stay well. Thank you. Thank you.